okay. Oh, okay. All right, this is an interview at the Hampton Inn, Johnson City, New York, the 18th of May, 2004, uh, approximately 11.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russage. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Carl Newton, Lockport, New York. And... Uh, 16th of January, 1925. Okay. Um, do you remember, uh, well, first of all, your educational background prior to entering service? What was your education? I had three like? years of high school. I, uh, instead of uh, staying and graduating, I volunteered for the draft. Okay. Um, where were you, and, and do you remember uh, your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was home. Um, my mother heard it on the radio and, and told me about uh, Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor and I was, uh, I didn't even know, never heard of Pearl Harbor but, and I didn't know where it was but I was very concerned when I found out it was relatively close to the, the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now uh, when you volunteered for the draft did you Wanted to go into the tenth mountain, or did you have any? I didn't know knowledge about the tenth mountain. Okay, how did you end up in the tenth mountain? Well, I wound up in the tank corps in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and during one of the interviews, uh, this officer um, who told me um, about the various opportunities for volunteering. He said you can volunteer for the ski troops or the um, paratroops. And I said, Ooh, ski troops, tell me about the ski troops. And so he said, are you a skier? I said, well, somewhat. Because I did start skiing when I was about five years old. And I had my first pair of skis when I was six. And I wasn't a great skier, but we didn't have great hills in Lockport. We, <laughs> we ran on the escarpment, though the, we had a good hill in the backyard that we skied on. And, uh, about, um, I didn't think any more of it. About a week later, first sergeant called me uh, my name. He said, report to the orderly room, and I was pretty much a screw-up. So I thought I was in real trouble, probably. And so I went to the orderly room, and he said, you've been transferred to Camp Hale, Colorado, with the ski troops. And he said, um, this was Wednesday. He said, report to the orderly room every day and then we'll find something for you to do. And on Monday, you're going to ship out. I said, how about a three-day pass? <laughs> he said, okay. And he gave me a three-day pass and I and I got on the train and went to Lockport. And come back on Monday and they gave me a great long strip of ticket, Pullman and meal tickets and shipped me to Colorado. And I arrived in Denver on Sunday night and the guys were just going back from weekend passes, and and they said, "What are you doing here?" And I, I said, "Oh, I'm going to be in the Death Mountain." And oh, he said, "You poor son of a gun!" Said, "You, you're crazy to enjoy this outfit now." Anyway, it was. Um, I got to Camp Hale that night, and it was just zero and three foot of snow on the ground. And uh, I was in the 90th, which was a. Uh, when the 87th went to Kiska, they formed the 90th Regiment. Well, then when the 87th came back, they broke up the 90th, and I went to uh, 86 and stayed in the 86, C Company 86, all through the, the war. And that was a good outfit. Oh, can you talk about the specialized training you were given, some of the... Well, we uh, we were out on skis and snowshoes all winter. We would go out on Monday and, and train in the mountains and come back on Friday. And uh, we spent three weeks uh, up in uh, a place called Cooper Hill. It was a ski resort and had a, a T-bar lift. In fact, it was the first T-bar lift in the country. And uh, we had intensive ski training. Uh, by some professional uh, instructors. In fact, my instructor was a famous Austrian named Friedel Pfeiffer. He was a uh, downhill champion and, and uh, 
we learned to snow plow with packs on our back and, and that type of thing. And uh, then we had plenty of practice after that because we were out on skis all, almost all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of weapon did you carry? Uh, originally, I uh, carried a uh, N1, mm -hmm. and then later on, because I fairly good size, they made me a BAR man. And that weapon weighed 20 pounds empty. And each clip, uh, ammunition weighed a pound. And uh, you had to be big and strong. And I lugged that thing up River Ridge. Mm -hmm. Now, did you find any problems with the BAR, with the weather conditions at all? Did you have to do anything special to it? Or? BAR was a very delicate instrument as far as maintenance. It had to be absolutely clean or it wouldn't uh, fire. And uh, But I never had any trouble with with my weapon. It, uh, it worked well all the time. But while we were in Lozano, the, we were built in, in a little pensione with partisans. And this partisan brought me a BAR that somebody had run over with a truck. And, and we hammered and pried and messed with it and got us so it would shoot one single shot. Because <laughs> the BR would fire whole clips of zip like that, you know. So we took it outside to try it out and he aimed it up in the air and shot off the telephone wire. Oh, gee. <laughs> How many times could you do that? <laughs> but it would only shoot one, one shot at a time, so it wasn't worth it, that's for sure. Did you leave uh, the bipod on at the end of yours? No. Took it off. Took it off. You didn't need any extra weight, and uh, you didn't need to have that bipod. It, no. But it's a very accurate weapon for the uh, firepower. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I became squad leader, I uh, kept the BAR, you know, mm -hmm. even though I was then probably would have carried a carbine or mm -hmm. an M1. Okay, um, now you did most of your training in Colorado, you said eventually ended up in Texas. Right. And you talked earlier about uh, being, Leading. having problems with acclimation to Texas. Could oh. you talk about that? Oh, you know, I don't know why anybody would ever want to live in Texas <laughs> in, the, in the summertime. That, that heat was terrible. And we just so you went right from the mountains into Texas? Yes, so. and, and the for the first week or two, all we did was lay on, lie on our bunk and sweat and go take a shower and go back and lie on our bunk. They didn't make us do anything. And then later on, they started taking us out for short hikes in the evening after dark when it was cooler. And then eventually, uh, we did a lot of training at night, but mm -hmm. then we also trained during the day. Mm -hmm. We had to, um, one week we had to, jog five miles with full equipment in a certain length of time. And then the next week we had to go seven miles uh, with full equipment. And then we, the next week we went 25 miles. And the Texas sand, and uh, at one night we'd start out mm -hmm. at maybe seven o'clock at night and get back in the morning and, and have the day off. Yeah. Now you also told us a story about uh being asked to help unload one of the trains one time. Oh yes, they uh, they grabbed me for duty when I and took us to the uh, railroad siding and and had us uh, try to lead mules back to the uh, wherever they were keeping them in the paddock. And uh, most guys couldn't handle the mules. The mules would start running and they would just hang on for a while and ski and on their feet and then let go and and later on we saw mules we'd be out on a hike somewhere and we'd see mules jogging along with an army tattoo on their neck you know and a little piece of rope hanging but i got my mule back because i'd had some experience of leading animals and uh, one of the few that got the mule back to the paddock now what were the mules used used for they were used for pack artillery mm -hmm. and for also equipment. Mm -hmm. Now, when you went overseas, did you take any mules with you? Um, I didn't. Did you ever see I don't any? know how they got over there, but mm -hmm. they, they 
did arrive in Italy, and we saw some, but they're all uh, being used uh, by Italians. They would uh, bring us uh, food, like I uh, remember one time we had a, a mattress cover full of dates that was on a mule back, and uh, they brought it up to the company area and, and uh, threw the uh, uh, mattress cover down, and, and then the uh, tie it hopped back on the mule and sat there cross-legged and, and <coughs> rode that mule back to wherever he came from. They were a very good mule handler. Mm -hmm. Now when did you uh, go up go overseas? Um, I, with Fred uh, arrived in, in uh, Naples on the 23rd of December. And uh, on Christmas Day they gave us a turkey dinner canned turkey and everybody got diarrhea <laughs> and we were on boxcars and that was a pretty tough situation. It was one of those 40 and 8 and they actually said on there 40 homes you know and, mm -hmm. and uh, 8 animals mm -hmm. and we went from there to, to Pisa. And we were stationed outside of Pisa for a couple of days. I saw the leaning tower in the moonlight the first time. And then we went to Leghorn and we were, we were camped on a, an estate, a big estate, like a park. And then from there, well, they took us by truck uh, north to the, and we got up to where he had to turn the lights off in the truck. and. And they, we got off and hiked 14 miles in the snow up to Lozano, and it was a very, very difficult hike. It was probably one of the toughest that I ever, because I was carrying extra mortar shells and plus all my equipment, and uh, I didn't think I could take another step or carry another thing by the time I got to Lozano. And they assigned us to a little pencil room, and uh, we were at the school in, in town and lined up along the sidewalk to the school with all kinds of equipment and rations and stuff. And uh, we got back down to um, this pizan, to the little uh, pension, and every single guy had a can of something. He had a can of coffee or a can of peaches or <laughs> you'd think, you know, they're not going to carry anything extra, but we all did. So, we now, what kind of, uh, how would you rate the winter equipment that you had? Could you describe it and tell us about your equipment? It was well tested up on Mount Rainier earlier by a group of 10 pound people when they were stationed out in, in California at Fort Lewis. And so I felt that for the most part it was very good. Mm -hmm. uh, we had parkas that were white on one side and OD on the other, and they were just a wind break with they had a hood with fur on them. We always took the fur off because the, our breath would freeze on the fur and it was uncomfortable. And we used that when we were training and then when we come into bivouac at night we had a, a jacket called a pile jacket and it had buttons but they were large, they were large uh, buttonholes so you could, I suppose, uh, button them with the, your mips on you know. And we had a, what we called bunny boots. They were felt boots. We took our ski boots off and put our bunny boots on. And then at night when we um, when we got in our sleeping bag, we had double sleeping bag. The inside bag came up to your uh, neck, and the outer bag had a hood on it. And we would put all our our ski boots and all our extra clothing inside the outer bag because it would freeze up at night, and if your ski boots were frozen, you couldn't get them on, uh, you could be court-martialed. Because uh, we wouldn't be any good uh, with ski boots we couldn't get on. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that was important, and I felt that I never got cold in the sleeping bag except once. We were caught in a blizzard on, um, up in a uh, treeless mountain above tree line, and we built a uh, wall out of snow blocks for a windbreak, but uh, 
I was uncomfortable all night, and the next day we dug a snow cave, and uh, three of us uh, stayed in that snow cave for two or three days until the blizzard uh, blew out. But the problem with that was it was on a, a cornice. Uh, that's where the wind blows over the top of the mountain and builds snow up on the other side. And so we were able to dig a good-sized snow cave there. But um, one of the guys was a cigar smoker. His name was Abe Tatum. He was, he was from Oklahoma via California. But anyway, he was trying to light a cigar and he couldn't keep the match lit. And finally it dawned on us that we didn't have enough oxygen. So we dug our way out. And uh, after that, we had a ski pole up, and well, we jiggle the ski pole so that we'd, we'd get oxygen in there. Because we, you, you know, you, if you die from lack of oxygen, you don't even realize yes, right. it. You just go unconscious. It's, uh, they say it's a good way to go if you have to go. <laughs> now, your uh, first action was at Riva Ridge. Well, we had artillery fire when we were up in Lozano, but um, it was kind of a iffy thing. Uh, if we, sh if they shot one, we'd shoot ten or twelve back at them, so we didn't get too much artillery fire. But I went on night patrol on snowshoes one night. There was quite a bit of snow there, but uh, we didn't have skis. I guess there were a few skis, but we didn't have them. So we went on snowshoes and we were going to do an ambush patrol because the Germans had been ambushing some of our uh, patrols and so we were going to try and, and uh, get some of them. Well, on the way out there was a stream and it was probably about six foot wide or maybe maybe a little bit more. And the guys are running and jumped across the stream. Well, I ran and just as I went to jump I stepped on my snowshoe and I went flat into the water and so I had to lay out there in the snow with wet gear for a while. But uh, you really, we didn't encounter any Germans in, on that patrol. Mm -hmm. So I really, really never got shot at until I got on Reaver Ridge. Okay, could you talk about the action at Reaver Ridge and, and from your perspective? Well, of course, we, we climbed it at night. Um, we had to cross a, a stream with a, a temporary, like, log bridge. And on the way up, I, we couldn't see anything. We couldn't you know, really know what was going on. There were fixed roads here and there on the real steep part. And uh, I remember a guy said, oh, I lost my helmet. And we heard a little clink way down. They said, oh my God, where are we? You know? Well, we got up on top of River Ridge and it was foggy. And so uh, we were well covered and the Germans were all in uh, uh, bunkers. And some of the guys went down and and woke them up with a, with a rifle pointed at them. And the uh, we captured a lot of them. In fact, I captured a guy. Uh, he surrendered, really. He was uh, running down across this hill on top of the ridge, and he was dressed in white like we were, and I thought it was one of our guys. Well, he got maybe 100 feet from me, and he dropped his pistol belt and threw his rifle down and put his hands up and, and come up, and uh, I realized it was a German, and he said to me, uh, got an American cigarette. <laughs> he spoke pretty good English. And he said he'd been freezing feet off up there for three months and he was glad to get out of there. Because all they did was observe. They were artillery observers. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any artillery. They would just call it back to the artillery emplacements and then they would shoot. So, so every time anybody did much of anything, <laughs> they would throw a shell at it. And uh, so uh, we, we could have captured all of them easily, except the, one of the guys in the company took a pot shot at a relief column coming up with a sniper rifle and that alerted them and they turned around and went back down. And then that night we got a counterattack and, and one of our squads was separated from the rest of the company out on a nose of the ridge and 
uh, we lost quite a few people there, uh, wounded and killed, and uh, so we had to retake that the next day. So um, Fred Shore was pinned down halfway between this platoon and the company with his white helmet with a red cross up there and made it a good target, and they were shooting at him too. And he was in a, a foxhole, and then we uh, had a, a running, screaming assault to retake that position, which we did. And during that time, I had a crease in my helmet just above my ear on one side, and I had a crease across the back of my helmet. And uh, one, when I hit my helmet, I turned around and looked at the guy behind me, and I thought he threw something at me to get my attention or something, but it was a bullet I later on realized. And a hand grenade, a German hand grenade, landed right in front of me, one of those potato mashers, and I picked it up and threw it back. It never did go. It was a dud, thank goodness. And uh, I had quite a few uh, close calls. Later on, I had a, a, a bullet. I was running across the uh, potato field outside of Sass Mulary where we lost a lot of people in that assault. A um, bullet went through my front of my helmet, through my wool cap, through my hair, and out the back end never touched me. And later on, I wish I could have kept that helmet, but, you know, use a helmet for everything. And it wasn't any good with a hole in it, so I threw it away. But that would have been a good souvenir to have. Uh, so uh, up in Reaver Ridge after that assault, it was a very difficult night that we put up because the, there were German wounded people out in front of us, and there was one guy was screaming and that he was freezing to death, and would we help him? And, he, and one of the guys. The, in my squad, my assistant gunner actually in the BAR, it was from Switzerland, or he had been educated in Switzerland uh, as a young kid, and he understood German. And he say, he says he's freezing to death. Come out and help him. And uh, we did. Uh, when, and the squad leader interrogated him. And he was a captain. And. Uh, they, but he was all shot up real bad, and he didn't make it. That uh, that was the trouble we had. We couldn't get our own wounded off until they, later on they built a tramway and, and it took our wounded people down on the, on the tram. And that guy, um, Paul Petzold, he was famous mountaineer. Later on he started the uh, outdoor bound schools. Oh, yes. And uh, he was assigned to build that tramway. Now, how, can you talk about that? How was that built? How did they... Well, there was a huge rocket at the bottom, uh, just across the stream where we started, and they anchored the, the cable there, and then ran the cable up the mountain, and uh, then they fastened the, uh, the litters to the cable, and, and they, it was kind of a hand thing, you know, mm -hmm. run them down. I mean, it was a fun ride if you weren't wounded. <laughs> we uh, we had to walk down. Mm -hmm. See, the Reaver Ridge was very steep uh, from uh, the American side. On the other side, it was gradual, and the Germans couldn't actually drive up there with a uh, with a jeep. Uh, it wasn't easy going, but they could get up there, and of course they could just hike up and and put the wood. They never expected anybody could ever climb from the other way. And so they didn't man in any positions at night. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky there. Because they could roll rocks down and knock us off the mountain. It would have been would have been absolutely shooting fish in a barrel, you know. Because it was uh, so difficult. There weren't any trees at that time. Now when we went back and 95, it's all uh, uh, second growth trees. But the uh, Italians had stripped the mountain of wood for fire. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the time of the battle, there was, abs there was no vegetation at all? No. Uh -huh. okay. so, it was
was um, it was difficult, but it was a thing I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. Now you uh, received a bronze star also. Where did you receive yours? Sassam Larry. Um, <clears throat> that's where I got the bullet hole in my helmet. And our squad was going across the field and there was a machine gun in a house on, up in town and uh, they had good field of fire and we lost um, um, Bill Crookshank uh, severely wounded. He wound up in the hospital for about three years. They never expected him to make it, but he did and he has one arm is uh, somewhat useless. And um, two of people in my squad were killed, and when I when I saw them go down, I went out to from where we were pinned down to try to see if I could help them. And when I got out there, I found they were both dead. So I got back uh, behind this wall that we were pinned down behind. So that's what I got the bronze star for. Okay. Um, yes. Would you tell us about the rest of your time after? Well, from Sassamalari, we went over to Grande Diano, and we were there for quite a while. And we had a, a tremendous amount of artillery fire. Uh, every day, we we would get um, artillery fire, especially around dinner time and, uh, in the early evening. And uh, the uh, artillery observer of our side came up. We had our foxholes were dug on the forward slope, and we had dug a trench between our foxhole and back so that we wouldn't have to expose ourselves uh, on the ridge going to our foxhole. And um, this artillery observer came up with a, his map and a, a plastic envelope and it's, it's shining in the sun and has binoculars hanging around. It was a sunny day and I'm sure that he would just advertise that he was there and he got in our foxhole and, our, and I was in there with my squad leader. I was assistant squad leader at that time because Bill Cookshank had been wounded and was in the hospital and he started calling fire from our foxhole. And Sure, boy, we got an awful bombardment. We had a tree burst right over our hall, and it killed my squad leader and practically blew the leg off of this artillery observer. And I got one little piece of shrapnel in my leg, and that was all. I dug that out myself. But the guy in the foxhole next to me, he was riddled. He had a bandolier ammunition hanging up, and, and uh, somehow that uh, concussion set that off and it just riddled him with killed him. And another guy had both knees, he was sitting in the trench with his knees exposed. And, uh, he had both his knees. And I never did hear uh, whatever happened to him. Uh, well, I wish I had fallen through, but I, I never did. Mm -hmm. I had many other things to worry about after the war. You said this fella, <coughs> it called the artillery fire in. Was that friendly fire that did hit you? Hit you? No, no, no. He he was calling artillery fire on the Germans who were down in the valley uh -huh. and then they uh, reciprocated with uh, a big bombardment. Oh, I see. Okay. Do you feel they they saw him, quote, saw him because of the flashing of the map and the binoculars? They knew where he was, yeah. yeah. Because uh, if we exposed ourselves early, we'd get, they'd throw a shot at us. Yeah, we cussed that guy, boy. Yeah. So then I, that's how I became squad leader, by attrition. Mm -hmm. so, uh, then we had a, a well, there was a house on, up there in Grandiano, and the Germans polluted it. And uh, every, almost everybody in the company got hepatitis. Mm -hmm. And I wound up in the hospital for three months, and that's where I was all through the rest of the war, where Fred had to slog all the way up through the Po Valley. And I missed all that. Mm -hmm. And I got out uh, of the hospital after the war was over. And uh, 
we were up in Trieste area at that time because Tito was was threatening to retake Trieste, and, mm -hmm. and um, so but we didn't have anything to do. We had a really great time. We'd get up and have morning formation, and then we'd be free the rest of the day. And, and we went hiking and we went trout fishing in an ice stream. Boy, that was a beautiful area uh, in the uh, steep mountains and narrow valleys. And in fact, there was a hotel there. It was a winter resort. And the hotel there, they had a climbing wall in the in the gym. And not, now climbing walls are yes. really popular. And there's where a steel, uh, um, well, like a big, say a uh, staple in mm -hmm. various roots up this wall for your hands and your feet. And, uh, and Fred was up learning how to uh, climb glaciers and and uh, I was in well I was in the hospital. It sounded it like a, sounded like you must have been uh, seriously ill if you were in there for three well, months. Yeah, that's a, at, at that time uh, it was a, <clears throat> they were very concerned about it because it could damage your liver, and, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so they they did keep us in the hospital for a long time. Today, I don't think they, they would do. They probably have medication. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when were you discharged? I was discharged in uh, December of '45. Okay. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Oh yeah, I went to college. Mm -hmm. How about the Fifty Two Twenty Club? You use that at all? Maybe a little while, yeah. But I went to work, um, I got out in December, just before Christmas, 17th of December. And uh, I went to work for Harrison Radiator, as part of General Motors in Lockport. And I worked uh, 5 to five to one thirty. I was sweeping the, of the custodian and the general offices. And then I went to college, or went to high school in the morning and took the required courses. Oh, so you finished high school after the war? Yeah, so I... Uh, I now, how did you feel being a little older than uh, <laughs> and uh, having your military experience? Did you have any trouble yeah. with studying or...? Uh, no, it was... Yeah, you know, I was sure with an odd duck as far as the rest <laughs> of the kids, and, and they, didn't know, they didn't know how to act around me, you know, and I really didn't know how to act around them either. And the teachers were... They didn't know what to do with me either. You know, uh, that was a pretty easy thing to, to finish high school. And, but I got out of the service before Fred did because I worked in the separation center. After they broke up uh, the tent, they shipped us all over, and I wound up down in St. Louis at um, um, Jefferson Barracks, Fort Jefferson Barracks, and I was a chaplain's assistant. And, <laughs> My job was to work in the separation center. When a group got discharged, I would take their discharges and uh, fall them out in the street and form them up and, into uh, some semblance of uh, good formation and give a guy a signal and he'd put on the Stars and Stripe Forever tape and I'd march him down to the post theater and then I'd introduce the chapel and where he served and all that. And then I had to discharge and I'd all. Bill Smith and I'd hand the discharge to the chaplain and, and he would shake their hand and then I, <coughs> after they all got discharged then I told them how they could get a photostatic copy of their discharge and then tell them to fall out in the street and we're going to march them down to where they get the bus. Well, some of them, you know, they, they, were, about, they were out, they weren't about to take any orders from me. But some of them did, you know, after being in the service for quite a while, he, he couldn't help it. Uh, okay, um, um, Bob, did you join any other, any veterans groups outside of the 10th Mountain? No. Okay. No, I, and of course you've stayed in contact and, and no, had reunions Fred, and... Oh yeah, Fred and his family and my family went to reunions all over the country. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you think the, your time in service affected your life or changed your life? Well, I think it had a, a really a tremendous effect on, on my outlook and, and life. And uh, I feel it was, the training was uh, 
something that uh, too bad uh, every young man can't uh, go through because I think it, it gives you a sense of um, patriotism and, and uh, a feeling that uh, so what, you know, that uh, uh, you like Fred said, don't sweat the little things. You mm -hmm. know? Do you think you would have gone on to college if it hadn't have been for the yeah. GI Bill? I probably would have worked in Harrison Radiator Division of General Motors. All I and my brothers, two of my brothers did, and my father did. Everybody in Lockport practically worked for General Motors. Oh, it was uh, sure helped me a lot mm -hmm. to be able to go to college on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much.